Human patient simulation is but one of the many educational tools we use to train our critical care transport clinicians. It gives us an environment in which our nurses and paramedics can not only manage complicated cases and hone their skills, but also allows them to invest in a simulated patient in almost the same way they would a real one. Besides actual clinical practice, we don't know of any other educational method that accomplishes this. Although simulation is widely employed in the training and practice of a broad spectrum of healthcare providers and professionals in other unrelated fields, the unique challenges created by the numerous environments in which we work and the diversity of patients that we encounter requires an unconventional approach. As with everything we do at Boston MedFlight, um, everything is, is a team activity and certainly uh, the lion's share of the work in simulation is done by uh, the other people uh, on the team who um, provide technical expertise and some clinical expertise and um, a lot of logistical expertise. Um, you know, the ability to do basic simulation is very easy and anybody can do basic simulation. The ability to um, make the cases mobile, to make the cases interesting, to make the cases realistic um, takes a lot of brain power and takes some, some knowledge and technology and frankly just a lot of creativity. Um, and we're fortunate to have a good group of people out here who can do that. The Commission on Accreditation of Medical Transport Systems requires certain um, procedures be done on a regular basis in all age groups that you transport. So that's a mammoth task for us. And as lucky as we are to have the clinical expertise of the hospitals that live around us and the opportunities to do training and education in all of those hospitals, uh, there's a lot that we can also do in simulation. So part of our keeping current and just doing checks and balances, do you know how to manage this patient? Do you know how to, to do this procedure? We do that routinely in simulation. We have that 35 minutes. As Mike and I set up the simulation, let's review the case that will be presented to our crews. In this scenario, the critical care transport team will be challenged by an entrapped trauma patient. The crews are given simple dispatch information and will find their patient is a construction worker who remains entrapped under a mobile rubble following a construction incident in a rural area. Heavy rescue personnel and specialized equipment are still responding, and the victim's fellow construction workers are assisting in extrication efforts under the direction of a fire department officer. Such unique circumstances 
will challenge the critical care transport team, who will be expected to demonstrate innovation, collaboration, and practical knowledge of the airway management continuum. It is hoped that airway management will be aggressively pursued, as the simulated patient will become unresponsive while still entrapped. Failure of basic adjuncts, conventional endotracheal intubation, and rescue airways may culminate in the need for surgical cricothyrotomy. In addition, the scenario will present an opportunity for crew members to practice their use of the combat application tourniquet. As the simulated environment and activities dictated by this scenario aren't exactly suitable for our sim lab, we used our ambulance bay as the stage. A custom construction was completed, which offered us a safe and stable platform that allowed for progressively improving access to the patient as extrication efforts continued. The platform was decorated with debris to give it the appearance of a recent structural collapse. Loud background noise, including radio traffic and construction site noise, was played over speakers, in addition to the numerous actual power tools used in the extrication of the patient. The wires, compressed gas, and blood supply to the human patient simulator were all concealed. In addition to the helmet camera worn by the actor playing the firefighter, a tripod mounted camera was set up to capture the entire scene, and a small camera was secured inside the debris to monitor airway management. Simulator controls were positioned off stage only visible to the participants as they entered the scene. During debriefings, many team members reported they often bought into the scenario and momentarily suspended their disbelief when managing the patient. As the scenario begins, the only access to the patient is through small openings to the patient's left and right at the level of the patient's shoulders. There is a paramedic caring for the patient and she reports everything below his torso is obscured. It is expected that they question fire personnel on the safety of the scene and stability of the rubble pile prior to commencing care. All crew members were provided with personal protective equipment and assurance that the rubble pile was safe to work on. The patient is somewhat oriented and in interacting with them when they first arrive at his side, but he quickly loses consciousness. The team is expected to manage the patient's airway to the best of their ability while debris is being removed. The methods team members initially chose to use in managing the patient's airway were varied. Some placed an oral airway and commenced two-person bag valve mask ventilation from both sides, others immediately placed rescue airways. All teams realized the impossibility of conventional airway management in such a situation. As both team members are managing the patient's airway, a distraction enters the scenario. The firefighter gains access to the patient's lower half through a panel over the patient's legs, which reveals an amputated lower extremity associated with significant hemorrhage. A single team member is expected to quickly place the tourniquet and return to airway management. Eventually, personnel with heavy rescue equipment arrive and allow for complete removal of the debris, limiting access to the patient's torso and head. Team members, if they have not already done so, will secure the patient's airway and direct immobilization and removal. Here we go. 
up to 100 in the fentanyl. Two. Color change. At this point, the simulation concludes and the crew moves to debriefing. Simulation education absolutely is part of continuous quality improvement because a continuous quality improvement and education are inextricably linked. Adequate preparation, proper debriefing, and team and team member evaluation are all valued components of the simulation process. A standardized evaluation tool has been developed to ensure proper care has been administered to the simulated patient, that all cognitive, psychomotor, and effective domain objectives are satisfied, and that teamwork is not only utilized but valued, and that participating clinicians contribute to the debriefing process. In addition, simulation profiles are created and shared with the simulation specialists and actors in order to ensure successful and uniform production of the case. The world of simulation has come a long way in the you know, decade or, or so since it really took off as a part of medical education, but um, you know, it, it, 10 years in medicine is still something that's really in its infancy, even 10 years in something in education is something that's still in its infancy. It decompresses. Um, some of the need that historically we had for on-site clinical uh, experience. It's also in many ways better than that on-site clinical experience because there's only so much that you can do and take time with when you're dealing with actual patients. And in simulation, you can do so much more. You can talk about it as you, as you go through a scenario. Uh, you can do it again. You, you, you can make mistakes and not worry about bad patient outcome, but see these as learning opportunities. Um, as education hours decrease and as the complexity of education increases and the volume of medical information increases, um, the chance to make each educational hour really count becomes more and more important, and simulation gives you the chance to do that. At Boston MedFlight, we look forward to continuing to push healthcare simulation towards the limits of imagination and technological capability, and collaboration and research with our healthcare partners in the pre-hospital and hospital environments. We thank you for taking the time to explore our simulation education program.